So Mad Friday, if you don't remember it, it saw the, the transition from GFH to Chilino as that takeover was going on. And it was out of one particular frying pan and into a different fire in one sense. So remind us a bit of what happened. Well, I'll set the scene. GFH are selling the club, which GFH were pretty much doing from the point where they, they bought it. It was always their intention to buy and sell either a, a major share or, or the entire club at a profit. And what they didn't anticipate and what kind of showed the, the naivety was that they obviously had it in their heads that that wasn't going to be difficult and that there would be people queuing around the block to take the, the club off their hands, even though the club in their period in charge made next to, to zero progress and and you know was was pretty much in a worse state when they took it over when they sold it than than it was when they took it over and people remember that in the towards the back end of 2013 this group emerged called um the sport capital consortium which was david haig who was obviously one of gfh's men along with andrew flowers who was the head of enterprise insurance and um, leads long-time shirt sponsor and, and, and others in the background, we were never quite clear on who. I, I sometimes wondered whether Haig himself was ever clear on who exactly was in that group. But essentially, it was supposed to go ahead and, and ownership of the club was supposed to pass from GFH to, to Sport Capital. And in January 2014, it, it pretty much fell apart. The deal ran aground. It wasn't able to be resurrected. And from nowhere, Massimo Cellino appeared at a game against Leicester City at Ellen Road, he was pictured um, chatting on to, to one of GFH. And, and over the next sort of week to 10 days, it became clear that not only was he interested in, in buying the club, but he'd pretty much done a deal already um, to take on a, a majority share, which took us to the point at the end of January where things started to get serious, things started to, to develop, and we reached the stage where the club was about to become Chilinos. You know, it is easy to forget just how chaotic it was, and that chaos ran really deep, didn't it? I mean, from... GFH meddling to Chilino jumping the gun with his appointments and the sackings and everything. Well, I'll give you I'll give you an idea. I, I always kept hold of this because I had a feeling that there would be occasions further down the line when, when I would need it. But at the time, somebody um passed me a copy of an email which was sent to McDermott from Hisham Al Reyes. It was like a directive from the Leeds United Board. And Al Reyes again was a it was senior figure at GFH and, and a director at Leeds. And it's long, so I won't read the, the entire thing, but it came on the back of that 6-0 hammering to Sheffield Wednesday at Hillsborough when it was kind of said that GFH wanted McDermott sacked at, at half time. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure they were actually going to do it there and then, but I think they were very close to, to taking the decision that, that he would go. So what they said to him in this um, letter the following week was that starting from the game against Leicester, which was the point at which um, Chilino turned up and was first seen in Leeds, he was required by no later than the Tuesday before the game to submit a full report explaining the poor performance of the team in the last seven games with detailed analysis um, explaining technical shortfalls and how they would be prevented. For every game onwards, you'll be required to submit a report on strategy to be undertaken, a list of players and squad formation, a minimum of 24 hours prior to the game for the group CEO and the chairman to approve. In other words, we want to see your team and we want to make sure we're happy with it before the, the game is played. And then afterwards, and, and this isn't as unreasonable as the other request, but you're to submit a report on each game with, with technical analysis again and, and to let us know what's going on. So McDermott is very much in a corner, but, but the bigger picture in the background was the fact that GFH had pretty much pulled up the drawbridge in terms of finance. They were getting tired of funding the wage bill and funding the club. They wanted somebody to come in and, and, and buy it and, and take it over. And you'll remember that Mad Friday itself was January the 31st in, in 2014. But you'll remember earlier that week, Leeds played Ipswich at Ellen Road and there'd been an attempt by Chilino to get Gianluca Festa onto the bench alongside McDermott to watch the game. Essentially because in, in Chilino's mind, he was going to sack McDermott and he saw Festa as a, as a perfect replacement for him, Festa being the, the ex-Middlesbrough player. Now, McDermott refused that request, but he could see that the writing was on the wall and he knew what was in the water and he knew that at some point, if Chilino did buy the club, he was going to be in a huge amount of trouble. And we'd reached the point on the Friday in the morning when somebody from the club phoned me and said, look, this deal is going to get done today. This is going to get agreed. The club is going to be Chilinos. They're going to sell a 75% stake to him. And at that point, all bets are off really and we have we have no idea what's happening. And the odd thing about that, that Friday was that Leeds were playing Huddersfield the following day and McDermott had essentially waited as late as possible to do his press conference, his pre-match press conference, 
And he wanted to do it because he didn't want to give anybody a reason to sack him, even the sort of spurious reason that you didn't do your press conference and you should have done, you're out. So we had this ridiculous scenario where we went and went to his uh, went to Thorpe Arch, sat through his, his media briefing around about one o'clock, knowing fine well that at some point over the next 24, 48 hours, it was very possible that he was going to go and, and that it was absolutely guaranteed that at some stage in the next three to four months, he would be gone as manager. And it's one of the saddest, most depressing press conferences I've ever been to, sitting there literally talking to a dead man walking, which he will say himself he he absolutely was. Moscow, you even kept a diary of these events, didn't you, on the night in question in your previous job? I was uh, ready to go home from when I was working at uh, the City Talking, which when it was a a newspaper and a a website. And um, yeah, it basically... it all started kicking off as as everybody was leaving. And uh, yeah, my role basically came to kind of synthesize everything that Phil and Adam Pope, who were the, I think they were the two of the coalface, trying to chip away and, and find out what was going on and, and try to keep some a kind of track of what was being said. So it was very much in vogue at the time to put it was before you had proper threads on Twitter, so you would take tweets and you put them into a, a blog. There were no moments then either. You do a you might do a story file or something like that, but I was doing that for a, for our website to to sort of update it. And, and yeah, I, I sort of thought, well, there might be a, a quick article in this. I'll, I'll put it together and then nip out. And um, yeah, it was after midnight, I think, when I I finally left that office. And I've always been interested because I would, you know I was doing it at, at one remove. But Phil, were you actually were you talking to anybody at the club at that time? Was there anybody answering answering the phone or anybody you could speak to? Because I'd I'd really love love to know kind of how their voices sounded. Absolutely, although I I wouldn't name any names, obviously. But um, there was a huge amount of resistance to Cellino's takeover because his reputation in Italy was well known, and I think a lot of the staff there felt that they would be extremely vulnerable if he was to to take the club over. Perhaps because of financial cuts, but more than anything else, because they knew of his reputation for for sacking people. The crucial moment on that Friday was at around about kind of five p.m. when Salah Nuruddin, who again was um, one of GFH's associates and and later became chairman of the club, or, or I think was chairman at the club at, at that stage he texted Cellino to say congratulations on your purchase of Leeds United words to, to that effect and Cellino basically took that as his signal to start bloodletting um, and within an hour a lawyer called Chris Farnell who was working um, for Cellino and was was set to become a board member at Leeds and was kind of doing a lot of the, the background work for him phoned McDermott to say you're out of a job. You know, you, you're being sacked. Um, Chilino wants to replace you. As of now, you, you're no longer manager of, of Leeds United. And this was, you know, less than 24 hours before the, the Huddersfield game. The plan was to install Jean-Luc Festa, uh, to have him on the bench as, as manager. And they called Neil Redfern down, who was, was working in the academy, but they, they called him down and, and to Ellen Road and said to him, you're going to assist Festa tomorrow. And you know, Redfern in the position he was in kind of said, well, I don't have a lot of choice. So he agreed to do it. And what developed from there was obviously the, the most crazy and, and bonkers Friday evening in which so much went on and there was so much infighting and so many problems that by the time they got to the next day, they couldn't actually leave Fest in charge of the team. It wasn't viable. It, it wasn't really safe to do so because the, the mood was going to be so sour at Ellen Road. And in the end, they phoned McDermott's assistant, Nigel Gibbs, on the morning of the game and said, listen, will you take the game, please? This was GFH. Will you take the game with Redfern assisting you? Because there's no way you know McDermott can come back to the stadium today and there's no way he can come down at this point and, and take the game himself. It, it would look even more ridiculous than, than everything else that was going on. So Festa spent the game in the East Stand, up a tier, I believe, criticising Leeds to death during the first half when they were struggling against Huddersfield, sitting saying nothing, and from what supporters have told me, taking dogs abuse in the second half when, when Leeds ran out 5-1 winners. So yeah, it was pretty much from 5pm onwards when, when that text was sent that, that things started to get out of hand. Just on Gianluca Festa, what was what was he brought to the club to do exactly? Because Cellino denied that he was ever brought in to be manager. He said he was just he never managed before and he was just someone he knew. But the fact he wanted him on the bench and so close to the team, everyone everyone was expecting him at some point to take over. Yeah, I'm just wondering what what you understood from it. Well, my impression at the time was that he was going to replace McDermott. If if not in the long term, then certainly in in the interim. The part of the issue with um, 
with Chilino was you, you never could tell and you could never be sure if what you were being told was actually what was going to happen in the same way as when Benito Carboni turned up randomly at Birmingham in a club tie and a, and a club suit we were all left asking what's going on here and, and eventually when I got round to speaking to Chilino he said he's coming in to run the academy which lasted for all of I can't even remember now, but two or three months tops. Initially, Carboni had a flat and he had a car, but then Cellino withdrew all of that and Carboni went back to Italy and, and that was the, the end of that experiment. So my, my understanding was that, that Festa was to take over, certainly in, in that period. And, and that was the plan for the Huddersfield game. But because of how things went on the Friday night, it, it wasn't possible. And I mean, it's, it's only when you start going back over it and you think about in detail what really happened that it you realise how, how ridiculous it all became. You'll, you'll remember Enterprise Insurance threatening to withdraw first team sponsorship and you'll remember Flamingo Land threatening to withdraw academy sponsorship, which was kind of almost unheard of for, for it to happen, you know, in, in the blink of, of an eye like that. You had the issue of Cellino trying to sign players um, and bring them in from Italy. One in particular, Andrea Tabanelli, who he thought he'd signed, but ultimately the deal didn't go through because... At the point where this was all happening, David Haig was in an aeroplane um, flying on holiday to Switzerland or Austria or somewhere in, in Central Europe. And he was one of the club's signatories that the EFL needed in order to officially sign off any transfer. And because he couldn't sign the document, the Tabanelli transfer was never processed and, and was never made official. So Tabanelli had the best part of a week sat in a hotel in Leeds, waiting for the EFL to make a decision on this, waiting for the EFL to come back to him. And, and given that there was all the furor around Chilino's takeover and given that the EFL were expressing doubt about whether they were even going to approve it um, in the first place, it was inevitable that that deal wasn't wasn't going to go through. And and he was one of kind of several victims um, of, a, of a truly, truly bizarre night, which, to be quite honest, felt like it was never going to end. Tabanelli's Instagram account was probably the highlight of being sat in that office after dark until the small hours as a as a piece of sunshine breaking through the clouds, the fact that that deal didn't get over the line is probably the one true tragedy of the the entire thing. Never mind Brian McDerber, he's fine, but we lost Tabanelli. I still don't really know much about Tabanelli, and I've I've often thought I might get in touch with him just to ask what went on, how was it, and and what was the the real story. And I mean, he he was by no means the only one. There was a, a kind of de facto chief exec, not again not officially in position, but acting chief exec by the name of Paul Hunt, who was sacked on the Friday night, was reinstated on the Saturday morning, but then before the game at Huddersfield was told to go home again and, and to the best of my knowledge has never been seen at Ellen Road um, again, which is not to say that anything untoward happened to him, but um, that, you know, that, was, that was him him completely done. You had Ross McCormack who had interest from Cardiff and was on um, Sky Sports News at least twice uh, and who was saying to Leeds, look, if, if this is going to be the shambles that it, it's developing into, I'd like you to sell me because it was transfer deadline day and there was still the, the possibility to, to let players go. And and he kind of said, I don't want to stay if it's going to be like this. You know, if there are better offers out there, then then let me take them. But, you know, Chilino wasn't having that. Chilino sat tight and said, no, absolutely, you know, absolutely not. Go away, leave me alone, and which McCormack did. And then you, you had the, the tweets, great tweets from um, Stanley Cars that were, were saying, can people please let a taxi driver get to the door to pick up Chilino because it's starting to run out of petrol, essentially because there were supporters down there who were kind of outside and making their, their feelings felt. But I don't think anything topped this off more than GFH announcing midway through the second half of the Huddersfield game that McDermott had been reinstated and, and announcing it in a way which almost expressed surprise that there was any doubt about his position um, and expressed surprise that people were kind of questioning whether or not McDermott was still the manager. And I mean, there was a, a massive shift into reverse gear from David Haig, from GFH, even from Chilino on that Saturday morning when it became apparent that this isn't really how you do things and, and the locals in Leeds are not going to be tolerant of of this going on. It was very short-term resistance because within about three or four days, the, the deal um, with Chilino was was put down in writing um, and was signed off by um, by him and, and by GFH. And even that, when you go back through the share purchase agreement and you look at what Chilino agreed to, what he, the, the loans that he agreed to service and the way in which he allowed it to be weighted entirely in GFH's favour is absolutely staggering. Is it right as well, Phil, that Cellino didn't do due diligence on the accounts and just went for it? Absolutely. He'd once said to me, in fact, he said a few times, if I ever did due diligence, I would never buy a club because there are too many things that are problematic. There are too many things to worry about. 
and it, it's better from my point of view that I just do the deal, get the club and, and sort it out. But GFH were were claiming to be owed loans in excess of £20 million, which, which he was agreeing to to pay back on top of the price for the club itself, which, as I recall, was an initial £1 million followed by two payments of £4 million. So I think £9 million in total. Um, so that was that was the payment. But then he had these huge liabilities on top that he was going to have to deal with. And people will remember that that became a, a very serious bone of contention. He went to Bahrain several times to try and argue the toss about those and to try and knock them down. But they were still there, those loans, when Radrazani bought the club in 2017. I was told back then that, that Radrazani, when he first came in, had paid a large chunk of them off. Um, and GFH had a debenture, which obviously covered Dillon Road and, and other aspects of the club's businesses, um, were essentially looked after in that contract and in that share purchase agreement in a way that their conduct and their management of the club in no way deserved. I mean, prior to Chilino buying the club, the players in McDermott had gone without wages because essentially nobody could agree who was going to pay them. GFH were going out the door, so they didn't want to. Chilino was coming in the door, but at that point... He, he was still waiting for his um, his his takeover to be ratified by the EFL, and and if they blocked it and prevented him from from buying the club, he didn't want to have responsibility for the the staff salaries either. And what I think was worst about that point was that on the day when the salaries didn't drop, and on the day when when the players and McDermott weren't paid, nobody even bothered to go to Thorpe Arch to speak to them and and tell them. Um, they were they were kind of left in the dark. And as much as McDermott tried to play it with a straight bat and say. You know, I just do the football. We, I just expect to get paid every month. You know, I don't think about my wage. I don't think about my salary. We did all say to him, you can't have had a period in your life before where you knew it was likely that payment wasn't going to come and nobody from the club has even had the decency to speak to you about it. And I I, I know that the results under McDermott were appalling towards the end and, you know, it, it reached the point of no return. But he'll, he'll, he has my greatest sympathy for what he had to put up with in those two or three months. <laughs> 